Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we have been doing these free mentoring roundtables for many, many, many years. We started in the fall of 2008. And as you can imagine, the fall of 2008 also saw the last major crisis that the world has seen. Of course, the one that we are in the middle of right now is of unprecedented scale. And uh, I woke up to this horrendous news that uh, there have been 6.6 .6 million unemployment filings this, you know, in the last week. So in two weeks, we have uh, 10 million people unemployed in America. Globally, the number, I don't have the number. I don't know what the number is. I can imagine what that number is. So uh, we are in a, we're living a dystopic nightmare right now. and. Um, in our community, in the startup community, the entrepreneurs that we communicate with on a regular basis, our effort has been to maintain as much normalcy as possible. So we are we're doing all our roundtables, uh, online rendezvous, online roundtables. We are basically a virtual company, so we do everything online anyway. In normal times, we do everything online. So we're just continuing as is, and we're trying to maintain as much normalcy, keep our platforms alive and available to our um, entrepreneurs. And uh, so anytime you need to talk and brainstorm about your strategy, what, what you should be doing next, and how to navigate, through your challenges, we're here. Come and talk, and uh, we'll do our best. The event is being recorded. Every single roundtable recording is available on the 1M1M one one roundtable page. Uh, those of you who are earlier on in your entrepreneurial journey and are trying to learn what is it, what is it to start a company, what is it to put one foot before the other in that entrepreneurial journey, you have a lot of time right now. Most of us are working from home, um, and a lot of normal activities are gone, right? There's no socializing with friends, going out to restaurants, going out to dinner parties or, you know, big parties, concerts, um, museums. All of that activity is gone, which is really sad because, you know, all these all those entrepreneurs who are dealing with, who run restaurants and who, um, you know, who have concert venues and so on and so forth, all of them are struggling terribly. Um, but now you have time and you can learn. You can spend that time. The best thing you could do if you have entrepreneurial aspirations or are in the beginnings of an entrepreneurial journey, the best thing you can do right now is learn. Spend the time productively in doing things that will help you learn. And listening to these recordings of the one and one and round tables is a good way to learn about how to look at businesses. So we do, this is our philosophy in this program is case study based learning. So we have entrepreneur pitches and dialogues about the strategies of those entrepreneurs, what's right, what's wrong, what needs to happen. And if you listen to enough of those, you're going to learn a lot. You'll also learn a lot from reading our blog where we have this series called Entrepreneur Journey, which is there are thousands of stories of how entrepreneurs have put one foot before the other to build their companies. All of these are free resources that you can leverage to learn during this time when you have time. Time is so precious. And right now, a lot has been taken away from us. Freedom has been taken away from us. but a lot of time has been given to us. So let us try to apply that time productively and do meaningful things that help. Um, you know, also it helps to remain sane, you know, normalcy, learning, these are psychologically 
positive um, mechanisms to keep preserve your mental health during these weird times. On Twitter, you can follow at us, us at 1M by 1M and at Romana. These are both channels through which we publish a lot of interesting, valuable content. Uh, this is a roundtable, not a broadcast, so we want you to participate. These are the call-in numbers. I will put them up in a moment. We have a couple of pieces of scheduled programming first. Today, we're going to start the meeting with a conversation with Darshana Zaveri, Managing Partner at Catalyst Health Ventures. Darshana, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ramana. Nice to be here and appreciate you doing this in the midst of, uh, as you very rightly put it, this um, unprecedented situation. Uh, it's nice to be able to continue to do the things that we love to do. Yeah. So, Darshana, let's uh, get acquainted and get you acquainted with our community here. Tell us a little bit about yourself as well as uh, Catalyst. Sure. Um, so, my name is Darshana Zaveri. I'm a managing partner at Catalyst Health Ventures. Um, I have been at Catalyst since its inception um, in 2008. Um, and we're, we're two managing partners that, that manage the fund, um, which is Josh Phillips and myself. Um, and we have been investing together since 2008 um, in this particular strategy that I'm, I'm about to de describe. Uh, my own background is, is in science. I was a bench scientist um, for several years um, doing pure pharma and drug discovery research. Uh, before mm -hmm. I went back to Harvard to get my MPA and then um, came to Catalyst. Um, our, our firm invests in, in healthcare, so we are a purely healthcare-focused venture capital firm based right outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we, are, we have about $150 million in assets under management across two funds, um, and we are now investing um, out of our new fund. Um, and within the broad space of healthcare, we specifically focus on medical technologies. Um, so we actually do not invest in biotech or pharma or pure drug discovery or anything that we consider um, sort of pure science risk. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, we focus on medical technologies um, like medical devices, some diagnostics and digital health. Okay. And um, could you double click down a little bit on some of the specifics of stage, for example? Let's start with stage. What, um, what stage do you like to invest in? So we consider ourselves pretty early stage investors. Um, you know, we will do anything from CDs A, um, even CDs seed at times. Uh, but certainly mm -hmm. Series A and, and occasionally Series B. Um, so we have some flexibility around that. Um, we like to, typically we like to be the first institutional investor in a company. Um, so we, you know, we bring the first institutional dollars into the company. Often um, with our money, uh, the company formation occurs. Um, so we're not, we're not afraid to go really early. Uh, okay. But I would say typically, typically we are Series A, where there is a product concept um, and some proof of concept that has been done in in animals or or pre or some preclinical work. Um, so pretty early. So let me let me ask you a few de uh, slightly detailed questions, just because you know early is where we play. So uh, early has lots of nuances in our world mm -hmm. because we are, you know, deep into early and early can be pre-product, mm -hmm. early can be with a, a product concept mm -hmm. and customer validation or channel validation, but not yet, especially medical devices, you know, there mm -hmm. are, it takes some resources to get a product to market. So it's not so easy to, you know, bootstrap your way to product and, and you know, selling products and all that. Then digital health is a little bit different. Um, so, so where you know, what do you want to see? Do you want to see a product ready? 
you want to see a product concept with some concept validation from the target customer base? What's, what, is the, what is the validation that you yeah. want to see to go into a deal? Yeah. Yeah, so great questions. And, and let me just step back to say, if you look across our portfolio, the majority of our deals are medical devices. So okay. very, um, you know, hardware focused mechanical solutions for healthcare uh, needs. Um, yeah. We do do some digital health, but it is very, very small part of our portfolio, okay. maybe one deal out of, out of the entire fund. Um, so that's yeah. not the core of our expertise, and the core of our expertise is really medical devices and, and diagnostics. Okay. Um, so as you correctly pointed out, you know, in, in those kinds of companies, um, you cannot really bootstrap your way um, to, to the market. It, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, early development, um, product development, uh, you know, uh, as well as clinical development and preclinical development that is required before you even get to market. And I, I have to say, when you kind of look at the, the types of companies that we are attracted to, uh, most of our companies will actually never get to market um, as independent companies. So most of them mm -hmm. uh, will be bought out. Uh, you know, these companies yeah. are addressing major unmet needs in healthcare um, that are long regulatory path and approve, path to approval. Um, and the majority of them will be acquired before they ever get to final regulatory approval and market. Um, so yeah. where we like, you know, what, what we like to see um, before we invest is a strong product concept. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes that product concept is just something on paper. Um, so I will give you an example. We invested in a company out of our last fund um, that was nothing but a drawing uh, on paper. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was not even a product to look at um, and certainly no preclinical data. Um, and in, so we're not afraid to get into deals like that. Um, however, what we will then do is make sure that we are appropriately capitalizing the companies uh, mm -hmm. and keeping them really lean until um, that, you know, critical clinical value has been demonstrated. Um, in, yeah. in the case of the company that I just described, we did a, a, a total round of $250,000. And, and that two fifty k got us to a product, um, you know, concept mm -hmm. that we could, you know, yeah. see. Um, and also clinical demonstrations of, of that product. Uh, and then we right. did a Series A uh, and followed with a Series B. Uh, but we just want to make sure that if we get in that early, that, that we're not putting up too much money at risk um, yeah. at those early okay. stages where there's a high risk of failure. Excellent. So what about geography? You're based in the Boston area. Where, where do you like to invest? Um, so we're pretty broad across the U.S. I mean, you know, we're a very small team ourselves. Um, as I said, we're mm -hmm. two, two managing partners and, and a few folks in the back office. Um, so we tend to be New England focused just because of our location and where we tend to operate and where our connections yeah. are. But we do have portfolio companies, companies across the U.S. We have one in Minneapolis and Silicon Valley. Um, in Utah, uh, we're about to do a deal in Orange County. So, you know, we are pretty broad uh, within the U.S. We do not invest outside the U.S. Um, that's not Got part it. of our mandate. Great. Let's talk a bit about um, some of the companies you've invested in and, uh, you know, what they do and when did they come to you? What did you see in those situations that caught your Attention sufficiently to want to write a check. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so, you know, let me just start by saying, you know, very at a very high level, we are looking for technologies within healthcare that are addressing very large unmet needs. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking cardiology, oncology, women's health, you know, big, big global. Mm -hmm. Uh, issues that are unaddressed, yes. and specifically those types of diseases uh, that cannot be addressed uh, with drugs or cannot effectively be addressed with drugs. And, you know, the very, very simplistic example I like to give is um, uh, if you have a hole in the heart, you know, you have a hole in the heart, 
uh, you got to fix it. It's it's a high value patient and a problem, um, and yet it's a mechanical problem, right? Um, so it needs a mechanical solution. Can't fix it with a drug. Um, so we're really looking for those types of technologies that will um, really change the therapeutic outcome for patients uh, in a big way, uh, in a major way. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the core of our thesis. Um, within that, uh, we particularly like the cardiac space uh, and the structural mm -hmm. heart space. We like the oncology space. You know, again, these are diseases with a great um, disease burden and burden on the healthcare system, and that are also strategically aligned with uh, with acquirers' interests. So, that's those are the areas that we are specifically looking at, uh, where we see a lot of unmet need. Um, so, some of the companies, you know, I will give you. I'll continue perhaps with um, the example that I started with. Um, the company that we invested out of our last fund, the name of the company is Envision Medical um, out of Silicon Valley. Um, so this is a device to diagnose um, ovarian cancer early in women who are at high risk um, of acquiring the disease. Um, so why do we like this? First off, ovarian cancer is a big unmet need. Um, you know, 80% of women with ovarian cancer are destined to die. Um, there, and the problem really is in the early diagnosis. Um, it's, it's, if you can diagnose the disease, uh, you can treat it effectively. Uh, but the problem yeah. is you can't diagnose it. And, and if you think about why you can't diagnose it, it's, it's a mechanical problem. The ovaries are in a part of the body that is, that are, that is hard to access. Um, there are no diagnostic tests available. There's no blood tests available necessarily that are accurate. Um, and so in order to address uh, this mechanical problem of accessing the ovaries, um, this, this entrepreneur, a very brilliant entrepreneur out of Silicon Valley, had the idea of creating a device. So almost like a pap smear-like device mm -hmm. that goes mm -hmm. deeper into the anatomy and collects cells uh, from the fallopian tubes and the base of the ovaries. And um, once you get the cell sample, the actual test, the diagnostic test, is exactly like a pap smear. So you're not reinventing the wheel on the testing side. You're mm -hmm. simply improving access to the organ. Um, so, uh, you know, how it aligned with our strategy is big unmet need, um, you know, huge patient population, large number of women walking around with the risk of having the disease and no way of being uh, screened or, or, or diagnosed early. Um, and an easy mechanical solution. I won't say easy, but a simple concept, uh, which is mechanical in nature. Um, and uh, there was no sort of, go ahead. I have a question on this one. Let's uh, just kind of stay with this example for a moment. What mm -hmm. is the go to market strategy for this company and uh, you know, what is your fund strategy or investment thesis around go-to-market strategy? You mentioned something earlier on that you don't, these companies not, don't necessarily go to market on the, their own. You are looking for early exits. So could you please just reflect on that yeah. uh, issue a bit? Yes. Yeah, so this company, as it turns out, did exit. Um, it, it was bought out in 2018 by Boston Scientific. Um, so we, we actually followed the company and we did the seed round. We led the Series A. Uh, we had a new investor come in and lead the Series B. Um, and then eventually um, in, in, in the fifth year, the company was, was acquired by Boston Scientific. It was a really nice deal and a, and a very nice return for us. Um, but of course, when we make the initial investment, uh, you know, we're not we're not banking on that exit. And we really do hope it's going to happen, but you know, we're not banking on it. So we do have to think through the eventual commercialization strategy, if you will. Um, and so, in this case, uh, what we liked about it is that, you know, there is a large number of women out there, about six hundred thousand in the U.S., uh, who know that they have a high risk of developing ovarian cancer. The reason they know that is because um, they have uh, some family member who had the disease um, or they are positive for the BRCA gene. Um, so, you know, either they have a genetic mu mutation or a family-related um, reason why they know they're at high risk. Um, so these yeah. are women who want to be surveilled, uh, and they are presenting themselves at the OBGYN's office. And so we do have 
sort of a clinical community that sees these patients and doesn't actually know what to do with them, right? You know, what kind of testing can we do to give them some assurance? A lot of these women are young women who still want to have children uh, and don't want to have their ovaries removed um, as Mm a, um, you know, risk-reducing kind of procedure. Um, So they're coming to the office. They're presenting themselves. So you have the clinical community that wants a solution, and you have a patient population that wants a solution. So we saw that there would be a pull from the market for this device. Um, Of course, we would have to go through a fairly large clinical trial to, uh, you know, to be able to claim that this device can now diagnose ovarian cancer. I mean, that's a a pretty large trial. Um, And so, you know, we had to kind of estimate what that would take. And if we had to take the company through that trial, you know, how much money would would be expected to to spend on it. Um, And then the final piece of this is reimbursement. You know, how do you get paid for this device? And it turns out um, that there are, you know, we did some analysis on this and actually hired reimbursement consultants and found that um, there is indeed a reimbursement code that can be applied um, to this particular procedure. So all of those elements put together um, gave us confidence that, you know, if we had to take the company through commercialization, that we would actually be able to do it um, and would have a good chance. And how far far did the company get before it got acquired? Did it go through the clinical Uh, trials? Um, so typically, if you think about medical devices um, like this that are typically multiple clinical trials, you know, there's usually yeah. an, a very yeah. early kind of proof of concept trial just to yeah. show safety that the device works. Um, and then you have uh, what I typically call a clinical proof of concept. So in this case, what we wanted to demonstrate is, you know, take a certain number of women and, um, you know, use the device and you know pre, you know, you know, um, who has cancer and who doesn't have cancer, or who has a high likelihood of having cancer. Um, so it, the company had cl- c- completed that small clinical proof of concept trial with 50 women mm-hmm. um, that was that with exceptionally good results, uh, and that would have informed um, you know the size and scope of that final pivotal trial that would get the company regulatory approval. Now that trial is not being done by this company anymore, um, but that's kind of the path to final approval and market launch. Okay, very good, interesting. So um, what do you see is going to happen uh, given that you are, you know, you're in a sector that is very relevant to what we are going through right now, and, and there is a furious effort to come up with all kinds of, you know, testing devices, medical devices for testing the mm-hmm. coronavirus and testing for antibodies of who has already got it and has become immunized and testing mm-hmm. for, you know, have you already had it and have been in asymptotic and all kinds of things, mm-hmm. asymptomatic. Um, and, and uh, you know, all all these are medical device problems, right? Then there is, of course, the vaccine mm-hmm. side, drug side that that is not relevant to your investment thesis. But there is a big medical device issue that is developing. What? How do you how do you process what's happening? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and and you know, we have certainly been thinking a lot internally about you know, does this or does this not change, um, you know, the way we do things and the things that we focus on. Um, So, you know, clearly we're not going to completely change our investment thesis because of this particular black swan event, Um, you know. So we won't suddenly start investing in vaccines um, or drugs or even drugs. Uh, However, you know, there's a lot of elements to this pandemic that um, are relevant to us in any case, given our investment thesis. So as an example, you know, we will certainly be paying a lot more attention to healthcare services, um, you know, broadly, including telemedicine, which I think will become Mm -hmm. more and more rampant and more used as time goes by, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think we will certainly be paying more attention to that space and the digital health space in general. Um, we've, We've always been... Um, you know, focused on uh, diagnostic devices 
And, mm-hmm. you know, we think in particular, and this, this pandemic has proven out that the American, um, you know, healthcare system is, is not really set up for early detection uh, and right. prevention. It is, it is highly geared towards treatment. And, you know, that is, that is a structural problem uh, that mm-hmm. needs to be fixed. And we certainly hope that, you know, as a result of this, this pandemic and, and the associated economic costs, that people will, you know, all, all constituents of this system, including the regulatory agencies and the acquirers, uh, will start paying more attention to diagnostic devices and prevention uh, versus care, right? Um, so yeah. so that, that's always been part of our thesis, and it will continue to be part of our thesis going forward. Well, and also to your uh, point about go-to-market strategy, uh, my, I, I don't know how this is all going to come together, but... I expect that after we are, we have dealt with this, you know, as you called it, the Black Swan is Swan event. We are going to look at the federal governments and the state governments putting in a lot more infrastructure to deal with similar mm-hmm. issues that can come up, and uh, and put a diagnostic early diagnostic infrastructure in place that is, you know, more home based and not so much. Mm-hmm. You know, overwhelming the healthcare system, the ICUs, and so forth. So, early diagnostic, I think, it needs to be part of the planning for epidemics going forward, pandemics and epidemics going forward. I, I imagine, I hope that the federal government and the state governments and the international bodies are going to uh, put that infrastructure together. So that is going to create a lot of opportunities for people operating in that part of the ecosystem to have successful companies. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's not just when you think about early detection and, and prevention, you're not just talking about the specific tests that are relevant to that, you know, particular virus or, or bacteria. It's That's also right. the instrumentation and the tools that go with it, yes. right? It, yes. It's both exactly. aspects of it. And and it well, is not just, uh, it's it's not just instrumentation, yeah. instrumentation and tools. It's instrumentation, tools, and the distribution infrastructure. You have to get these exactly. tools and systems exactly. in the hands of the people in the last mile, so that these things can happen far away from the hospital. Exactly. Now you're you're exactly right, and we will certainly be keeping an eye out on you know those types of technologies that facilitate that infrastructure. Um, and but, but the last thing I wanted to mention is, you know, if you think about COVID and its impact on on the population, it, you know, we're we're still waiting for you know all of the the data on this to fall out eventually. But it's clear that you know people with comorbidities are impacted uh, much much more than people who don't have comorbidities, right? So, it, you know, people with underlying respiratory conditions or yes. diabetes or cardiac issues or oncology. Yes. So ultimately, you know, this is part of the overall health management of the population, right? So in, and our focus on on kind of the technologies that address those underlying conditions is, is kind of just as important as, um, oh, you know, no, I, I think the, the regular system. management of all those uh, diseases is going to remain uh, investment opportunities. I think biotech is one of the most exciting fields, um, and, and so I think your core investment thesis remains. It's more right. like, you know, there is something new that is that needs to be dealt with that we, we're discovering we're woefully underprepared for. The systems doesn't, don't exist, the tools don't exist, the tests don't exist, the instrumentation doesn't exist. It's really terrible. Right, right, right. No, you're exactly right. And so a lot, a lot of you know, investment needs to occur in the infrastructure um, space to to kind of deal with this um, if and when. It's really not a not a question of if; it's it's a question of when it happens when again and how. And yeah, absolutely wonderful, wonderful conversation, Darshana. Um, there is a company in our portfolio that comes to my mind right away that I will uh, uh, send you after we are done with this call, and uh, we'll see mm-hmm. if that's something. Um, you know, interest you in the pain we would love to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Look Great. At it. Very good. All right, folks, we're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch section. And uh, 
just want to set expectations for those of you who are planning to pitch, whether it's today or in one of the upcoming sessions, it doesn't matter. Remember, this is a safe working session. There is no other ulterior motive or agenda. Um, you know, this is not Shark Tank. We are not trying to entertain a large population of people and get good TV ratings. So we don't need to be snarky gratuitously to get some points from the entertainment value point of view. We are purely trying to work with you on your strategies, and that's the only thing we do. You know, this is about accelerating entrepreneur journeys, helping entrepreneurs remove their roadblocks and connect the dots to so that you can make progress. So that's what is the culture of this program and this community. If you disagree with my feedback or a feedback you get from one of the investors here or somebody who's you know, mentoring you with me, don't worry about it. It's what, what we give you is based on experience. You need to take that, understand it, process it, understand the issues and decide how you're going to play your cards. You don't have to play your cards to please us. You need to play your cards so that you can achieve product market fit, that you can, so that you can achieve investor entrepreneur fit. Those are the things that if, if you're raising money, those are the things that help you move forward. And everything we do is geared towards making those important milestones become possible. One thing you should remember, though, is not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. So don't be obsessed about raising money. We're going to work today with one company, that is Palacio. And Palacio is actually a member of the One Million by One Million Premium Program. And they are trying to, I've worked with Rahul Ramjan of Palacio for for actually more than a year, I think, at this point. So I know this business very well. Rahul will summarize what he does. But what we're going to specifically work on today is a pitch for a partnership that we are helping Rahul. Um, you know, we're connecting the dots. We're bringing him in front of a partnership, a possible partner that could help with distribution. So that's the context of this next conversation. And remember, we are. We do case study-based learning, so our whole philosophy is that you can learn from looking at how other entrepreneurs are navigating their journeys and how, you know, how I'm advising them or we are advising them to put one foot before the other. All right, Rahul, up to you. You are on. Thanks, Ramana. This is Rahul. Hi, Rahul. Hello. Go ahead. Yes, would you please summarize uh, Palacio for everybody to follow along and then we can go straight to your uh, Blackboard presentation. Sure. Um, this is Rahul. I'm founder of Palacio Incorporated. Uh, this is art and tech company. Um, uh, we are operating for over three years now. Um, our first product, Canvia, is a smart art canvas uh, or digital art frame. Um, essentially, it's a monitor wrapped with mad wood and wood frame uh, and powered by our ArtSense technology. Um, that makes this monitor look like a uh, looks like a real painting or um, printed version of photograph. If you upload any digital version of art or photograph onto it, it should look very, very realistic. That's the main idea of this product. But apart from developing the product and technology, we partner with uh, museums, galleries, artists, photographers worldwide to make sure when our customers buy this product, they get to see thousands of artworks and photographs that they can change depending on time, mood, occasion, and decor. At this point of time, we are currently um, sipping in US and Canada. Uh, we are uh, very soon going to um, uh, launch the product in Europe. Uh, we Europe and uh, we have customers all over the world. Uh, we haven't shipped to other parts of the world like uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Japan market. Uh, that will go there very soon. So, um, yeah, that's that's uh, about Palacio and Canvia. So, uh, what Rahul is going to work with me on right now is uh, a strategy for his pitch to museums. 
Um, and you know, right now, we are, the situation we are in is because of coronavirus, the museums are facing an unprecedented level of drying up of visitors, right? Museums are large public spaces usually. Even small museums are relatively large congregations and, and gatherings of people, and people don't want to gather anymore, and they will not want to gather for a while. So given that scenario, how do museums stay afloat? How do museums, you know, justify their subscriptions to their subscribers? How, what, what is the way that museums can survive and monetize so that they can stay on? So that's, that's a space where we believe that Canvia can make a contribution, and that's the pitch that Rahul is working with me on. Go ahead, Rahul. Um, thanks, Ramna. So, uh, like uh, Ramna said, I think uh, this pitch is particularly uh, addressing the problem that museums are facing right now. So, um, museums normally, like, uh, they have visitors and <clears throat> members who can visit the exhibition and the gallery and, and whatever special events and normal events they have. Um, but they don't have any way to reach customers if they don't actually visit them. Um, and and second aspect is they never try to monetize the digital version of content. And this is something that we focus in any case. Uh, we don't focus on or even touch actually physical artworks or uh, printed version of photographs. What we do is we just monetize the digital version of all the art content. And they never try anything like that. Um, and then also they never they don't have any remote channel like they need right now. So we by default, I uh, think, focus on those areas. Like we we digitize, sorry, we monetize the digital version of art um, and then solve three problems for our customers, in, even in normal circumstances, which is um, solving the budget issue um, for our customers, uh, solving the real estate issue, and finally the time issue, the time in finding the right artworks. Um, and And so, um, at this point of time, we are trying to solve this problem for museum uh, using our product and platform. So, our uh, next slide. Uh, our um, our so, solution uh, is uh, what? Rahul, yeah. just a second. Let me give you feedback on this slide. This is mm -hmm. not a good yeah. slide, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yes. I you are remember you are going to be sending this to. Blackboard, you're going to be sending this to the museum customers of Blackboard. So this slide deck yes. needs to be able to explain what you do um, in a way that it can stand on its own without you providing the voiceover commentary. Sure. So, so bringing fine art and photography to every space is great. I think. You need a slide that explains um, explains what you do, like you did in voiceover. You need one slide that just summarizes what is your business, what do you do, what you know, all the things that you said. But you need to very crisply and concisely summarize what that is, and then this slide is not friction between customers and museums. What you are Pitching specifically right now, given where we are, you are what you are showing is for museums to monetize their digital art. That is true. That, the, yes. The tagline, right? Yeah. The tagline is not solving the friction between customers and museums. The tagline is to help museums monetize their digital art. And the problem is that for the foreseeable future, museums are going to lose in-person visitors. So how do yes. how do museums monetize? How do museums rationalize their subscriber base? Why would I subscribe to a museum if I cannot go to the museum? It's a very good question that every museum subscriber will have to face. So that's yes, the agreed. point uh, that you could yes, make. Yeah. Yeah. That's the pain uh, point that we're solving here. Yeah. 
and then let's go straight on, uh, into PowerPoint. yeah so I, I would switch this slide to that to capture what I just said, and then you can say that Cambia has a solution, and then explain how you would solve that problem. Go ahead. That's, I assume this is that slide, right? Yes, this is the solution slide. I uh, think, uh, yes. So, um, yeah, so problem, uh, so the solution is our platform where we inherently um, help the content uh, portals or content organizations or studios uh, or independent artists to um, upload the digital version and they we can we push it to our customers right this is what we do and we share the revenue under normal circumstances also this is our model um, but in this case I think we have gone one step up um, in solving this problem so um, we have developed a business model where uh, if you go to the next slide, I think that's that's where we want to focus. Because this one, uh, I think, is more about our digital platform and, and solution, and talking about our parent printing uh, technology. But the engagement model with the museum is basically um, they become our channel partners. Um, like uh, we use Amazon actually for selling our product, or Adorama, or Blanche, or anyone we partner with, right? Oh. Now. And uh, so we give them. Uh, like some percentage of sales. So why not we give it to museums themselves? So there is upfront incentive for them to um, advertise about us and promote us through their channels, right? And and so that is, we. I have put, uh, like that's one aspect. And then once they sell this to their fan following and, and custom, like custom uh, members and followers, um, they will be able to, um, bundle it for their content and um, this this can be tied with their membership or any other means but this extra dollar per year that they charge to their customers is for digital content that they offer through um, through their interface uh, on canvia right um, and this this we have we will share like some some they get some we get and mostly they get uh, we get get some cut of it actually um, and that's the model that I'm proposing to the museum. Um, they may have, and this is something uh, up for discussion with uh, like each and every museum. Um, they can even try doing variable pricing uh, where they can offer certain content with higher price or lower price or uh, for certain duration. But in general, the model um, can be very simple also, like um, proposing and the entire model has been built around that is, hey, charge some $50, $100, or $200. What do you think is appropriate for your um, customer base uh, on yearly basis? And then we get the cut. Um, and then from our side, I think we take all the like heavy loading, um, heavy lifting, sorry, around um, uh, hardware device, customers like uh, technical support. Uh, we take care of developing the uh, interface. We already have, but I think we'll have to enhance a little bit. Um, the uh, interface for uh, them to upload the digital content and then uh, customers will get those content through the Canva device. Uh, we'll also promote uh, all the content partners, which we do in any case, uh, as much as uh, capability we have right now. Um, so that is the framework. Now in this framework, uh, like there, there is one, scope one to discuss feedback, and there is scope I would to find say, oh, Hold on, just one yeah. feedback. Canvia's mm -hmm. promotion of museum events and stuff is not going to be so interesting for them because they have much bigger following than you do. So they do, but I, uh, but it's a cross. So let's say uh, because our customers are all over the world, um, that's something that museums may not have. So let's say um, we we are in Europe, uh, Australia, Canada. Um, they may not be there in those countries actually. They definitely yeah, have but, bigger, even but if more there, that's yeah. going to create a problem. This is going to create a problem because if you say that I'm going to take your museum subscription uh, base and subscriber base and then promote other museums' content to them, they're going to worry about wallet share, right? You know, if I'm a museum, mm. if I'm something for MoMA, I'm trying to sell my device and my subscription, my content subscription to my membership, and you're going to promote the same to that same membership if you're promoting Metropolitan Museum or Guggenheim, they're competing for the wallet share. Um, 
so let's discuss this. So I think uh, in terms of promotion, I may be there, but I, I didn't uh, think that way. But definitely there is a conflict because uh, uh, irrespective of promotion, like that's easy to yeah, there is easy that that one is easy to remove, right? But the conflict is there actually on let's say they sell um, let's say MoMA sells it, right? Um, then um, the Getty Museum will say, hey, you already have MoMA. Are my customers going to get Getty Museum also as channel or no, right? And this is something that I thought a lot, I mean, I discussed also with the team. Um, then obviously for, from our side, we want to give flexibility and opportunity to our customers to subscribe to anything. Um, but the way museums work, I think they are definitely um, want to protect their fan follower, right? So I they want to make Rahul, sure they get what we offer, yeah. No, Rahul, I think this is going to play out differently. I think you're going to have to yeah. have different devices for different museums. So your Getty device is going to be Getty-specific content, and your MoMA device is going to be MoMA-specific content, and they're just going to sit in different places in a person's wall on a person's wall. So one wall is going to have the Getty device with Getty subscription. Another wall is going to be the MoMA device with the MoMA subscription. And you sell two devices to the same customer. Um, let's try that way. I think uh, I don't have a very um, like uh, strong, like really strong opinion either way, actually. Um, unless we talk to them, we wouldn't know. So we can try that. We wouldn't know, exactly. Um, I yeah. think that um, will keep things simpler. Uh, sorry, say the last line again. I think that will keep things simpler because you are trying to create, you know, when you're trying to do a channel partnership, how that channel partnership splits up revenue and everything, everything is going to be a lot simpler if you work with white label devices. Yeah, I thought about that, and I think uh, becoming white label is, is is basically a great strategy right now. That's no problem. I think uh, keeping Canvia brand is uh, is good if if it can be kept. But if it's even if it's not kept, um, just for the sake of the uh, like uh, nullifying the logic that we are trying to address right now, right? So basically, if they get scared, uh, then they won't sign. That's that's easy. That's um, exactly them, right. Right. That's exactly yeah. right. So, yeah. No, I, I, I am up for it. I don't think uh, I'm against the idea of uh, being white leveled for this purpose because, um, so let's, yeah, let's go for it. I think uh, have the uh, like uh, uh, MoMA branded device and then um, Getty branded device. And, and we do give option in the bottom, like there's a scope to discuss. And if you brand it that way, then uh, we may charge a little bit more or something like that. I mean, I have to think a little bit more on that, but I guess well, without see, going into the pricing. The way, think yeah. about, Rahul, think about one yeah. thing also. I don't want this, this uh, frame. If I put this frame on my wall, I don't want it to say MoMA or Getty or Canvia. I don't want it to say anything. I want it to look like a, if, a, if I put a regular piece of art, it doesn't have branding on it. It has the art. And I want it to look as natural as possible. I don't want any branding in there. So there's no opportunity for branding here. The only thing you can do is content. Mm, there is no branding, but it's still like, um, how to tell you, like there, are, like in our product that you buy right now, right, is uh, the uh, first time when it boots up, you will see Canvia, right? If you go to our uh, website, I mean the member website, who, who those who buy the product, um, they see Canvia, right? Or anything they do, there will be Canvia, Canvia, Canvia everywhere. Like right from the mobile app right. to website but to the desktop website, app. Everything. You're going to need to see, yeah, on the museum website, you, you're going to need to brand it as their museum device, basically. Yes. Yeah, so if, if it's going to be white labeled, um, I think there is some work over there, basically. Uh, um, but but if that's acceptable, I have no problem, right? So uh, maybe no. the way it pans out. Go ahead. So let, uh, yeah, so maybe I think for bigger museums, I think it's a problem, and of course they will push towards uh, having white level device, right? 
Um, so I think uh, we should have the white label as well as say a hey, scope of uh, discussion because the moment they try to white label, there is a work for me actually. Um, and yeah, maybe may for a smaller for you, museum. But each deal is going to be a very large deal, right? If a museum sells a million devices for you and a million subscriptions, all of which are revenue generating these are, now you're getting into enterprise now you're an enterprise business you're a b2b business you're no longer a b2c business this is a b2b business or b2b2c business um, so you will still need to create the the shipment infrastructure the logistics infrastructure for the b2c portion but but you are you know these B2B2C channels, each of them are going to be large channels that sell a lot of devices. So it would be perfectly worthwhile to do it that way. No, so, so I, I don't think, I'm, uh, yeah, that, that's perfectly fine. So what I'm saying is uh, for bigger museums, um, I think uh, they may want white label devices, but maybe if they are not very big, they are okay to uh, like have the branding and then try it because if there is work for us, I think, um, okay, let's let's keep it this way. I mean, I just, I'm trying to position if it's a, a single deck that goes to Blackboard, I think that's, the, that's my problem. So uh, let's keep it black, uh, like uh, white level to, uh, targeted for each museum. And um, then there is a scope of discussion kind of wording somewhere, I think, uh, so that there is a flexibility uh, on both sides, right? Uh, when we discuss yes. with them. Okay. Um, so this this model is, uh, I think I have kind of described. Basically, I am giving them 20% of the sales um, upfront, and then um, the number that you see on the left hand side, like 10,000, 100,000, or 500,000, is basically the number of members, visitors, uh, social media followers, everything included. So this number is. Um, kind of some modeling I had to take. And I looked at MoMA numbers and it was two to three million visitors per year. Yeah. So I sure. kind of uh, basically took 500,000 as the max number. Um, and then um, the 50, 100, 200 is yearly fee, they charge just for digital subscription, uh, not uh, their own normal membership actually. 5%, 15%, 20%, 25%, uh, there, there is reasons for me having different uh, uh, margins just for our discussion. It's not exactly how we, we will present, but basically, um, so 5% is let something me, Let me try to uh, understand this. You are saying that they will be paying you 5% commission, 15% commission, 25% commission. Is that what you're saying? on the digital content. So basically, if they are charging 50, 100, 200 is their fee to their customers. Right. Um, and we will get the cut because we are managing the platform and then also supporting them right. on device and everything, right? We need to have some right. cut actually over there. So yeah. uh, at this point of time, when the situation is so bad, I'm willing to go for 5%, no problem. Even 0% is fine, but 0% we won't survive actually ourselves. No, <laughs> so no, we no. need uh, at least 5% for that. And then in the normal circumstances, we can do uh, 15, 20, 25, whatever, even 10 is no problem. Um, for me, getting the deal done is, is bigger uh, issue than basically uh, striving for a bigger margin. Uh, but not having a very big margin also is not a very good idea to go on negotiation table, right? So, um, no, that's right. something not like only that, uh, you're going to have to service these customers. So you need the margin to service these customers. You know, some somebody's going to yeah. have the device is not working. I need help. I'm going to I need a helpline to call me to help me set it up. Blah blah blah. Right? Yeah. So I think uh, what I was thinking is uh, at this point of time, till this issue uh, persists. I think we can go for 5%. In a normal situation, we go with 20%. Like I'm giving 20% of hardware sales, uh, I get the 20% from them on the content side. Um, yeah. But I mean, I'm open to discussion. I mean, if someone is really, really yeah. pressing, and we have to put one number, right? So um, I put 20% in normal situation, 5% for current situation for a year, let's say, right? Not not current, like for a year, first year, because the, the yeah. um, coronavirus situation, we grew 5%, but going forward, after that, we 20%. And let's say they, what they say. I mean, they can always come back and say plus, minus, and whatever, right? Um, um, and an then, so this revenue, yeah. And then so, this percentage. This is, you just, last... the two people, that, you know, remember, we are talking about 
uh, three players, right? There's Blackboard in the middle of this that needs to make some margin as well. If Blackboard yes. is so going to I looked at yeah, Blackboard, yes. Yes, so I looked at Blackboard, and I, the way I understand is um, we will have to integrate our Amazon interface with their Blackboard um, portal. So the museums use Blackboard for different reasons. Um, one is fundraising. for uh, like fundraising, other is for finance and accounting, third is for yeah. CRM, right? So customer resource management. and. Um, yeah. Any of this, I think uh, this is what she mentioned even in January that they are not structured um, to do something like that. Uh, but then she didn't give a uh, detail uh, details on, on what she meant by structure. Um, I am not hundred percent sure, but um, likely I think it's going to be a uh, like uh, uh, API connection with our AWS with Blackboard. Uh, this is this is going to be one time effort for each museum and um, in this case um, they make money because museums are going to make money uh, because their their customers are museums and if museums are doing well they will continue to pay them the subscription fee on the software and development effort they will charge us also probably some money because we are going to develop this uh, software uh, on their platform or they will help. I don't know how this pans out. But from a financial transaction perspective, um, their incentive is to make sure museums are doing well and they keep on paying the subscription fee. Um, rather than, uh, I mean, rather than they, them getting anything from the model that I have created. That's my understanding and that's, I may be wrong. That's not, I, I'm not sure that's gonna fly. I think if you can structure this such that from the, uh, the digital subscription margin, you get some, Blackboard gets some. Let's say, you know, Blackboard wants 10%, you want 10%. That's, that's a reasonable split, and that's going to make it attractive for Blackboard to do this with you. And there are multiple touch points. I mean, CRM, museums have to communicate this stuff to through CRM to their customers and their subscribers and their followers and so forth. So if you can work through, you can work with Blackboard to integrate the promotion of this um, such that they close these deals with the, um, you know, of their fundraising campaigns. How, you know, you have to understand the features and functions of their fundraising campaign, fundraising product and their CRM product and see what, where you can integrate, how you can integrate and then you end up with a 10%, 10%, let's say 20% is what you're targeting, or 25% is what you're targeting from the digital content revenue, and Blackbird takes 10%, you take 15%. That's, that's a reasonable three-way split of this revenue. Um, okay, so no, that's why I'm, I'm discussing with you. So that's no problem, so let's say, um, Let's keep 25 in that case, uh, if there's a split, and then we, I, uh, like we keep 15, they get 10, and then rest the uh, right. museum's get, right? Um, right? Do you want the split on the upfront sales also, or that should be given to museums, all uh, 20%? On, on what, the hardware sales? Uh, hardware sales, yes. The hardware sales. Um, well, how much margin do you have on the hardware? Um, I don't have a lot of margin, but I pay definitely. I pay 15% uh, to Amazon, and sometimes a little bit more. So I lose uh, 15 to 20% in any case, actually, in any sales. Right. No, so beyond you're my proposing website. to give so that 15 to 20% to the museums anyway. That is true. Yes, that that makes I mean yeah. uh, complete sense, right? I and mean, yeah, so that's yeah. no problem. I think, and, and that's a model that we were pursuing in any case. So. I just converted the model for museum, but this is a model yes, that a was under consideration. Uh, that's yeah. very good. Yeah, yeah. And I, I actually yeah. think that if you tell, if you explain that to Blackboard, that you know, instead of Amazon being the channel or whoever else being the channel, you're turning that channel to the the channel. The museum becomes a channel, and the channel commission is going to the museum, and Blackboard doesn't get any of that channel commission, but it gets the commission on the digital subscription. That would be attractive for them because they are a subscription revenue-based company. True, 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 true. Yeah, they will be, and hardware sales is a big incentive for museum because 
there is enough margin actually for them to have uh, yeah. like digital they may or may not uh, like uh, foresee how exactly it's going to work out uh, but they will be able to figure out with time but this one then they will have uh, upfront incentive for sure i think they will yeah, figure and, out and, how and, to yeah i think they will figure out yeah. how to do the digital content as well because you know i think in in each case in each museum's case the question you are posing to them is that if you want to charge if you are a you know big enough and a and a prominent enough museum like a moma or a um guggenheim or a metropolitan museum or a national gallery of london you should be able to figure out a collection of digital assets where you can justify a $200 yearly fee right yes and i actually think that even small museums with smaller members can still put together a collection that is that can justify a $200 yearly fee i agree so, i mean this is not about exact uh, economics it's about people who really love that museum actually so uh, exactly. they donate money in any case actually to the museum so they will be there's no problem That's for right. them to have something in return uh, um so from a museum so yeah i i agree so, that they they can potentially charge more also so i think one thing you can take out and make it simpler is this $50 $100 tiers the 10000 100000 500000 tiering is right because the museums don't have as many subscribers lots of museums don't have as many subscribers um right. but if you just make it a $200 and and what you're telling the museum is that put together a collection that can justify and that that your subscribers are willing to pay $200 a year to have this piece of art on their wall digital art but for realistic kind of and and you have all the royalty rights to do this with us and with to, you know that that's what you're doing that's the product that we are putting together and and then you can you know then $200 out of that $200 you know 10% is $20 so you know let's say if you 25% of that is taken out you're taking 15% blackboard is taking uh 10% that's you know $20 a year across large numbers of consumers that's that's a very good revenue base for the for blackboard and for you you know that that's true uh, if uh, this this works and this is great model i mean um just we, even if we don't make a lot of money per user like even if it's $5 or $10 just because the numbers are huge uh, and and across many museums uh, i think uh, this uh, this model should pan well, out well actually yeah well yeah. well you can't you can't assume that everybody is going to buy so you have to i wouldn't assume that millions of users are all going to start buying these devices and putting them on their walls right away so don't assume that the numbers are going to be millions and millions and millions right away so you do need no, to no, make no, no. <laughs> good money from no, no. each of them no no not i i don't the million but i mean million is a big number for this market but but the chances of them buying uh, from museum basically because we are targeting very targeted audience also right these are the people yeah. who go to museums Uh, and very so chances people. of them buying is is very very high so i have a no, 2% no, no, penetration no, no. i i go to museums i'm not going to buy this because i i this is not what i want to put on my wall i want you know that is true you have that to get true. over that, the yeah get over the push back no, no. of digital versus real that's always there so yes of course the people who go to museums they love the physical piece but under the current current circumstances museums are going if they don't agree with the logic and they don't push it we don't have much chance my my uh, i mean our argument is under the current situation they are helping museums through this pro- in this effort actually that is the premise right so then they will have more incentive to buy and, and sales are okay actually to be honest i was surprised also but last two weeks the sales are back i um, mainly because people are locked in in their home and they don't have like they want to see something right it's it's very uh, uh i didn't realize this till i started seeing like no sales are sales are back actually it's normal so mm-hmm. um this makes sense actually in that way um 
yeah i mean we can only do there try so my uh, i think it, if there's enough there's enough margin for you there's enough margin for blackbird and and uh, and enough mar- enough revenue for the museum so it's uh, you know i think this is a good model so a uh, couple of questions i think um, you want only one yearly fee like 200 and uh, or do you want at least two of them 100 and 200 just 200 i'm thinking just 200 yeah okay and then other question is uh, do we have to show the entire revenue projection for canvia or we just put the museum's revenue projection and then put the commission as split over there um i think you should this this pitch is for both museums and for blackbird so you should show right. how much blackbird makes how much museums make and and you should also show how much you make just so that you know they understand that there is a reason for you to do this and true, i mean true, be true. transparent okay. yeah yeah let's uh, yeah. let me do that 200 dollars and then uh, split across three parties and uh, clearly parties. so uh, yearly uh, recurring and then one time split uh, and three years on purpose because uh, i wasn't sure like how much it this first year second year third year so 2% penetration is for 3 years actually so i take the number and then multiply it with 2% and split in 3 years equally that's how i have modeled it out i see 2% of the so so this the model is 2% of the number on the left column here the 10000 100000 yes in 3 years so let's say they have they can target uh, 100000 people visitors or followers or members whoever yeah. then uh, 100000 multiplied by 2% in that okay. many numbers we will they will be able to get in 3 years that is the idea that right. is the model right. yeah okay perfect which is right. reasonable it's not okay. very very high i think that's that much they should uh-huh. be able to sell yeah um so let yeah, me there's a question uh, there's a couple of questions hold on rahul just a second there are a couple of questions mm-hmm. from the audience that i want to answer um sure. somebody whose uh, handle is showing db i don't know what your name is um you you have two questions one is this is a presentation to a digital distribution partner right no projections of their revenue yes there is this is a, that is the discussion we are having on what is the percentage split between uh palazzo the museum and blackbird is the name of the distribution partner that's what we are discussing who makes what we just discussed the 10% for blackbird 15% for palazzo and uh, the rest of it 75% for the museum so that's not the answer to your first question second question you're asking incidentally i'm also a museum member here in london and this is not something i would want unless it really is revolutionary paper like tech question answer number 1 is it is revolutionary tech but the second question answer to your question is remember rahul is assuming 2% of the 100000 are going to be reached as buyers of this product in year 3 so Yes, there are definitely there are people like you who would not buy, but there are two percent of this audience who would probably buy and who are more digitally savvy, more technology leaning, and so that's it's, a, it's that factored into the assumptions. Does that answer your question, DB? <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> All right, Rahul. What else? You can re- you can repurpose this presentation um, if you want. We can go over it again before you. send it to blackbot but i think you have all the information with which to do this right yes yeah, so i think uh, yeah that sounds good so i need to uh, change a little bit uh, i'll keep some of the one i think uh, you want the last slide if you go to the next one <coughs> yeah this is what i think i need to push but a little bit more information about the product actually first slide um, i'll put it up there and then i'll start into the problem um, that medium is facing right now and then solution and then go into the details of the uh, like uh, framework and then model okay great and by the way once you yeah. are you know let's say in the next 3 years this business becomes solid if the museum business becomes a major business for you you can also layer in your hospitality and office and all that enterprise strategy on top of that later because now you have all these museums that you can bring to these um 
you know, enterprise partners, and that's a different discussion, that's a later discussion that you could also be having. Yeah, I mean, um, enterprise side, I mean, like I discussed last time, uh, we can come back later on. I think at this point of time, that discussion is not going to happen with hotels, I think. I mean, no, we may be lucky with few of them, not. but the effort is, is, is futile at this point of time. So we have to pick the absolutely battle, and this is time. probably the right battle. Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. hotels are going to take two, if not three years to recover. So this is, right now, I think this is a much better strategy than the hotel strategy. Indeed, I think I, I am with you. I think if there is single one one uh, project that we need to target, I think this makes a lot of sense actually. So yeah, we'll right. uh, I'll I'll change the uh, deck and then send you. Great, perfect. Good Thanks, work, Rahul. I'm actually quite excited about this strategy. This is a very good strategy, I think. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm as well. I think. Uh, so is the team, actually, everyone now. Yeah, so the, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense, yes. Okay, very good. All right, folks, um, we are going to spend a few minutes just to explain to you what is, uh, you know, what can you do to access the One Million by One Million program. Um, before we do that, I just want to request you to refer serious entrepreneurs to One Million by One Million, people who are looking for help. A lot of companies are in need of support and help and so forth, and we are here. We have been here for 10 years, so we will hopefully be here for a long time and be able to help entrepreneurs as much as possible. And, and um, what you experienced just now, I spent 45 minutes with one entrepreneur you know, going over his strategy and fine-tuning the business model and so on and so forth. This is what we do in One Million by One Million is to, Rahul is a premium member of One Million by One Million. Um, for all our premium members, we do intense strategy work, intense positioning work, and intense connecting of the dots. The Blackboard contact is ours. It's a partnership that we have with Blackboard that we are bringing Rahul into. So we are very, very generous about time, about advice, about connections, and, and I hope that we will continue to be able to be so for the foreseeable future as all the entrepreneurs in the world navigate this nerve-wracking situation. This is a horrendous situation, economic situation out there in the world, and Rahul's original plan was to approach hotels and do enterprise deals for his device and subscription. And we just, within the next, last week, we've completely pivoted the strategy to this museum strategy. I mean, this was done in real time almost. So this is, you know, just to give you an example of what, what you can do with good strategic thinking, you can actually react to externalities, events, unexpected events, and still be viable with a different strategy. Strategy, we are believers in strategy. You know, I've, I am a great believer in strategy. Um, in life, in business, in everything. In day-to-day -day life, I'm a believer in strategy. I'm not a believer in, you know, of the cuff, doing things without thinking through the consequences and so forth. So, so that's the philosophy, that's the ethos we bring into One Million by One Million, and that's why I founded One Million by One Million to begin with. So resources-wise, you can go to 1mby1m.com and you'll find everything. We are a 100% digital program, virtual program, so you can access us from anywhere in the world at any point you wish to. There's a blog that is very rich. There's a book series that you can access. There are 12 volumes of Entrepreneur Journey's books. Um, these roundtables happen every week. Over 150,000 people have attended these roundtables. And right now, unless, you know, me or Maureen, somebody gets sick, who organizes this program or anchors this program, we're going to continue to do this and be there for you as much as possible. So nothing, no change whatsoever in our workflow, and we, we will be here, come discuss what your issues are, we'll try to do our best to help you. The premium program is where most of the value of this program is. 
And that's our full acceleration program. We offer you extensive methodology guidance. We have a full digital curriculum that you can access from anywhere in the world. We help you with business development, just like you saw with Rahul. Uh, we are helping him with the business development with Blackboard. Uh, strategy consulting, this is strategy consulting. What we just experienced with Rahul is strategy consulting. That's what we do in the premium program. All our members are, can access strategy consulting through these roundtables. We also have a terrific investor network. We have a company that is going through financing as we speak. I, on Monday, I introduced this company to 26 investors, and I heard back from 13 within, you know, three, four hours. Um, so 50% hit rate is very good. And there, I, what I keep hearing back from my investor friends is that people are working. People are looking at deals. People are interested in doing things. If people are not sitting idle and not looking at deals and taking a vacation at all right now. So if you are looking for financing and if you get to a fundable state, I, have, I can get you to a fundable state if your business warrants that through the program as well, um, I will be able to introduce you to investors. Anyway, that's the premium program. I recommend that you go through the self-assessment. It's a free tool on our website. Go ask yourself these questions. Try to answer them. If you get stuck, you can access the 1M by 1M curriculum. That's 1M by 1M basic curriculum only option. The curriculum is accessible from anywhere in the world. You're very welcome to start studying. As I said, start studying. Please start studying. If you are a, an early stage entrepreneur, if you haven't done this before, there is a lot of learning that you have to do and there is no going around that learning. You've got to learn these things. And we are trying to help you with that process, but you have to learn. You know, one million by one million is like a gym membership. You will, do, you will not lose weight unless you do the work and use the machines. So in our case, we have all these virtual machines that you have to use to get in shape, to get in front of customers, to get in front of partners, to get in front of investors. You just saw how I was working with Rahul to get him in shape to get in front of a partner, a distribution partner. Anyway, dig around on the website. We explain very, very clearly what we do, what to expect from our various pieces of resources. There's lots of FAQs, video FAQs. The curriculum is described in great detail. There are over a 1,000 successful entrepreneurs case studies that we um, use to build this curriculum. Um, you will have blueprints of how entrepreneurs have gone to market, built their businesses based on those case studies, and that are, those are very, very helpful. Uh, our methodology is lean, capital-efficient, bootstrap startups. The philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later. And that's it. The next four roundtables in April are basically the four Thursdays, upcoming Thursdays of April, 8 a.m. Pacific time. On Tuesdays, Tuesday mornings, 8 a.m. Pacific time, I also do this online rendezvous on LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live, and Twitter Live, uh, Periscope TV on Twitter. So you can also catch me on those. On those, I ask, mostly answer questions that we get from different sources. In these, the roundtables, I actually review businesses and, and strategize on businesses. So that's what our program structure is. We do have a bit of time. I'm happy to answer questions. If any of you would like to ask me questions, please dial in or ask questions in public chat. That's fine, too. Um, and we can dialogue a bit more. Uh, meanwhile, if you have questions about the 1M by 1M program, please contact Irina Patterson. Her email is irina at 1mby1m.com. Her phone is 786-301-2456. Uh, please text her before you call her so that she knows that she's available. Um, that's it. Good morning, Chantanu Dev. Please go ahead with your question. Would you like to dial in or ask your question in, in public chat? Where are you dialing from, Chantanu? New Jersey. Oh, God. Okay. Hope you're safe and staying inside, not getting exposed. Hit by COVID? You have COVID? Okay, all right. Yes, New Jersey is hit by COVID. Maureen is also in New Jersey. 
we have a lot of friends and family in the New York, New Jersey area. So we are very aware of the scale of the problem. Come pitch, I saw your notes on LinkedIn. So come pitch your business in one of the sessions and let's start working on your business. Great. Anybody else? Abhijit Sangupta, you're sending me a private message. I would prefer that you send your public, your chat to send to all participants. Abhijit Sangupta says, good evening, ma'am. Although there seems to be an anti-China sentiment nowadays, do Chinese startup founders or entrepreneurs participate in these roundtables? Absolutely. We have no anti-China sentiment whatsoever. Chinese entrepreneurs are just as welcome here and have been welcome all along and have participated as intensely. So no, no anti-China sentiment whatsoever. The anti-China sentiment, if you want me to comment on this, is coming from the fact that China is sending out doctor numbers and they hid, they tried to hide the, the pandemic early on and that puts a lot of burden on other countries. If other countries got the notification that things are getting serious, when if they were getting serious, they would have been able to prepare more seriously and more sooner. That's why people are upset with China. But China is struggling terribly. You know, Chinese economy is getting absolutely devastated right now because the, you know, first China did the lockdown, that impacted their economy. But now the whole world is in lockdown, demand is drying up, the Chinese factories are running empty. So China is, is really suffering and, and you know, I'm, I have tremendous empathy and tremendous, you know, concern about the strife, the economic strife of that country. So no, no anti-China sentiment whatsoever. Anybody else? Questions, comments before we adjourn? All right, I don't see any more questions, so we'll adjourn for today. We'll see you next week, maybe on Tuesday or Thursday, and for premium members on Wednesday as well is, an, is the option to get together. See you soon. Please stay safe. Follow the directives from your governments and uh, don't take any undue risks. It's just not worth it. Bye. Thank you for coming today. I hope it was helpful.